it's closing if I just stand still Cause you won't wait forever so just hit me up It is not like I don't want you Just scared to try Even if the odds are in my favor I just need more time So if you wait just a little bit longer I will treat you right Treat you right yeah. So as I say
Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing today? Uh, I'm doing okay. You're doing okay. Just woke up. Yeah. <laughs> I my my son went in for it. his strep test yesterday and he came back today positive. Okay. So that means so is that what everybody that's, has? That's what everyone has. So I'm waiting now for my results. Actually, I just called my doctor's office and I said, can we just skip the test? Because we know it's going to be positive. <laughs> just to go straight right. to the antibiotics. And so uh, right. they are looking into that to see whether they can just uh, speed things up by about 24 hours. Um, yeah. Cause like, yeah, my wife is a vet. And a lot of times she'd say, well, you know, we can run the tests, but it's not going to change what we do. And yeah. if it's negative, what we do isn't going to hurt. So let's just skip the test. Yeah. And I prefer that like everyone sort of antibiotics at the same, roughly the same time, rather than one person like get ahead of the others and then just kind of get, you know, reinfected or, you know, continue, have continue spreading the bacteria around uh, while others are getting better. So, um, and now, now we got to think about like my nine year old who's at school, like who, who just has a regular cold, but we don't know if he also has strep. Right. So right. now it's like whole chain reaction of stuff happening. Um, and then I read online, like, like, should I get antibiotics for strep? And one, one website came back. One of the first hits says strep usually just resolves on its own in, you know, four to seven days. So antibiotics may or may not help. And then another website says, yes, absolutely get antibiotics because there are all sorts of complications with the, uh, the bacteria spreading throughout the rest of your body. So it's like kind of confusing there. Uh, you know, do you need it or not? Well, we'll err on the safe side and get antibiotics. Um, I, I, I guess I have to apologize to the people in my class. Um, I, I came across something rather embarrassing the other day. And uh, that is a couple of weeks ago, I was able to do like a marathon grading session and just plow through a whole bunch of my uh, classes. And at the end of it, I went, yes, I caught up. And then I went and finally looked at our class here and realized I had done my other classes and not this one. And so you probably noticed that many of your assignments have not been scored yet because I just plum forgot. Um, I was so proud of myself of having caught up or at least thought I caught up, but it wasn't in this class. So I have my work cut out for me over the next few days to get caught up so that when we come next week, you know, everything is as is, is done as possible. Um, luckily, since most of the assignments or all the assignments are graded complete or incomplete, it's going to be pretty easy because if the assignment, you know, works and it works well enough, uh, you know, I'm just going to mark it complete. Oh, uh, hey, you know, uh, I just noticed you. Uh, do you mean to be recording? Yes. I think we're not recording. Oh. <laughs> this is where my brain is, right? <laughs> recording yeah, in progress. There we go. Okay. Yeah. Oh, so let me let me start over there a little just... bit. Um, so so I found out the uh, I, so I just started the recording because I forgot to hit record, uh, but I found out the other day that I had not yet caught up on the grading in and I, I you know the. I hate using the word grading because I'm not really grading anything. I'm just marking them complete or incomplete. But I, for lack of a better word, um, I thought I had gotten all caught up, and it turns out I, I didn't. I just plum forgot to do or get caught up in this class. So I have my work cut out for me this week to get caught up. Fortunately, since assignments are just marked complete or incomplete, the vast majority of you are just, you know, you're just plowing through them. It, the, the programs work well enough and you're getting the main concepts. I'm not going to haggle over little tiny things that I think are inconsequential to, did you, did you get the concepts and were you able to you know, complete the assignment satisfactorily? So I'm not, you know, I'm not gonna mark things incomplete because you were you know, missing, a, the comments weren't good enough. I'm gonna say like, you know, it was good enough. Let's move on. And you know, if there are some glaring errors, like something is really not working, I may pass it back to you and say, you know, could you rework this? So I'm gonna to try to do that you know, as quickly as possible so that you've got some time over the next week to, to get caught up on that. So I do apologize that I thought I was all caught up with the grading and I'm not. 
um, that's my fault because I should have I should have been more thorough in checking my to do list. Um, so that's kind of where we stand right now. Um, in the next day or so, I'm going to get up that schedule where you can start putting your time slots in for meeting with me next week. Um, one little thing about that time slot is it's, it's going through a scheduling system that basically will set up a Zoom session for you based upon your time slot and give you a Zoom ID number. I want you to completely ignore that. Just use the student hours Zoom ID and I'll, I'll post an announcement to that effect. Uh, but still, it trips up some people. <clears throat> and the reason for that is I have to meet with you like roughly six hours a day for five days straight. And it's easier for me to just sit in one Zoom session and have you come and join me rather than have to switch back and forth between 100 Zoom sessions over the next five days. Um, so when you sign up through that scheduling uh, website and it gives you a Zoom ID, just completely ignore that Zoom meeting and use the student hours one. Um, so I think that's it for announcements. And we've only got one person on Zoom. And we've got, what do we got? Uh, one person on, on, on YouTube. So it's kind of a slow day today. Well, here's what we're going to do. Every year, there is a website called uh, Advent of Code, and it's a programming competition. Uh, there's no prize at the end, as far as I know. Uh, but it's, it's just a programming competition, and it spans 25 days and a total of 50 programming assignments. It starts on December 1st and ends on December 25th. So at 9 p.m., my time, Pacific time, the first programming assignment will open up, and then people will get started. Thousands of people across the world will get started on this. And there's a leaderboard. And the first person to solve gets the most number of points. And then it goes down from there. Um, so I was thinking that we could solve some of those problems. But we can't do the ones for this year yet because they're not open. So we'll take a look at some of the advent of code puzzles from previous years. And just try to work through them uh, in, in C. And then I also thought it might be interesting to uh, find out what it's like not only to solve the problem on a modern computer, but what's it like to solve a problem on an older computer? And I happen to have some, in, you know, in the background, you can see behind me, like uh, right there is an old compact Macintosh from about 1990 or so. It's a Mac SE30. And, um, you know, it's, it's, it's fully functional. I just haven't turned it on, but uh, I do have a keyboard and, and disk drives for it. So that would work. And then also, oh, you can just see the top of it over there is an Apple II GS from about 1980, Ooh. I think they came out in 1986 or so. And um, that was the computer that I wanted when I was in high school, but could not afford. That was a really expensive computer back then. What instead my family had uh, was one of these was the Apple, yeah. the Apple IIe from roughly 1982 or so. And um, this, is, this is not it. This is not the one that I had, but it's, a, you know, it's the same model. And you know, I, I have to really give kudos and thanks to my parents. And I didn't realize, that, realize just how much of a sacrifice it would have been to buy one of these back in the 1980s. Um, I think the computer itself just the computer was maybe $1,400 for the computer. And, and that's just a bare bones computer. You have to add on disk drives like this. And I think each one of these was about three or $400. And you need at least two. So there's you know six to $800. And you needed a monitor. And I got one in the closet over there. But it was an old CRT monitor. And those would have run about another two or three hundred dollars um, and uh, you know as it was this computer came with 64 kilobytes of memory and most people got a an expansion card to bring it up to a total of 128 and that was another you know three or four hundred dollars and you needed a printer of course 
and it was an old dot matrix printer. So you're looking at, again, another three or $400. So all together, just a basic starter package would have run you three to $4,000 back in the 1980s. And that was a lot of money. I mean, I would say due to inflation, prices have roughly doubled, so almost tripled since then. So imagine spending almost $10,000 on a computer. And that's just you know, like one computer for your entire family. So for them to have spent that kind of money to buy a computer for the family was, must have been just an incredible sacrifice on their part. And you know, it's not like you know, Apple being Apple and they're just jacking the prices up. I mean, that's just what computers cost back then. I mean, they were just incredibly expensive. So these days, of course, you can buy a nice mid-range family computer, desktop computer or laptop for what? Uh, maybe 500 to 1,000, you know, for the whole package. And for them to have spent what, the equivalent of nearly $10,000, you know, is just mind-boggling. So w what's in one of these things? Uh, first of all, they're very easy to open. You just pop the lid off. There's no tools needed, no screws to undo. Just pop the lid off, and you can see the computers are actually, they're mostly air inside. Um, but what we got here is, uh, what can we point out? This right here, this fairly kind of largish rectangular plastic thing is the processor. This is an 8-bit 6502 processor. And then there's some ROM and RAM chips down here to give you your 64 kilobytes of memory that it came with. And then over, what do we got here? This, it's got a bunch of slots inside. And this slot right here is for attaching the disk drives that I just showed to you a few minutes ago. And it's got a, it's got a port on the back for connecting the disk drives. Uh, this here is a serial card for attaching external modems. And this is the card for attaching a printer. And then finally, this card here is a modern replacement for the memory expansion. This memory expansion card cost me $40, and back then it would have cost $300. This one cost me $40 and gives me a total of, I think, um, I don't remember what it was now, maybe four megabytes of memory, you know, which still seems silly to us. But four megabytes would have just been, you know, <laughs> an astoundingly large amount of memory back then. Much more memory than the processor itself could access. So the programmers had to do a few tricks to be able to access anything above. 64 kilobytes of memory, and to have four megabytes would have been just luxury back then. Um, I'm looking at some YouTube comments here. Really ama uh, Abdul says, I'm really amazed by these old computers. I don't know how people got the idea of making a machine that displays whatever you want on a screen. You mean like like how did how did computers themselves kind of get started and who had the idea of of like making a computer in the first place? I, I guess you know there's there's no like answer like someone just woke up one day and said hey I'm going to make a computer and it's going to display whatever I want on the screen. No, every computer that was developed was done so because it needed to address a specific need or the desire to do something a little bit better than the year previous. So how, how, did, how did the first computers come to be? Well, the first computers were basically just replacements for like old manual calculators. And by manual, I mean like, you know, think about the abacus or think about calculators that might have little gears in them to do their counting. So if you want to, let's say, add 23 and 34 together, you would, you know, basically click some wheels until the number 23 appeared and then you'd click one of them three times and one of them four times and it would just roll over and the gears would calculate your your answer so the first computers were basically electronic replacements for that and then the next computers were replacements for like well geez now that we can add add things wouldn't it be better if maybe we our computers could I don't know you know print something to a piece of paper or get input from a keyboard and so the next computers were created to to do that and so every computer that was created was just a a, a little bit 
of an extra feature on top of whatever existed before. And it just incrementally moved forward through the years until, uh, plus technology moved forward. So once we got rid of things like punch cards and paper tape and printer outputs, then someone said, well, why don't we hook up one of these newfangled televisions to the computers so that we can display some text on the screen. And the text on the screen was really just a replacement for the old printed stuff. Right? And, and so that's why today we still count lines of text from the top of the screen because that's analogous to counting lines of text from the top of a piece of paper. And uh, for things like a terminal, you know, when you use your terminal window, the default size for it is usually 80 columns wide by 24, 25 lines uh, deep. And that was the size of the old CRT displays from the 1970s and 1980s. So all of this stuff that we kind of take for granted now was just incremental improvements on top of whatever came before. So, I mean, this computer gets its heritage from the old Apple II computer, which was invented in the um, like late 1970s, 1978 or so. And so a lot of the stuff in here is sort of historically bound to the original Apple II and Apple I computers. This is, I would say, one of two iconic computers from the 1980s. If somebody asks you, like, what was a typical computer from the 1980s, probably most people would say, like, the Apple II, because a lot of schools used this, a lot of families had these. And another computer that was uh, in, in use was, oh, I can't even reach it because it's way up near the top of my Talk my office here. Oh, quite a stretch to get to this. This was the Commodore 64. And, you know, it's a little bit smaller because it was developed about, uh, I'm going to say, four, I'll say maybe six years after the Apple II was developed. And so by then, technology had shrunk a little bit. And the uh, Commodore 64 really benefited from an additional five or six years of development in that the graphics are much better on the Com Commodore 64. The, um, uh, the, the amount of memory in it, of course, is 64 kilobytes by default, whereas on the Apple II, it actually came with only 16. The original models came with only 16, and then you had to add on more afterwards. Um, but it does not have expansion slots like the Apple II does. Rather, it has just a whole bunch of connectors on the back, and so all your peripherals would connect by cables. So disk drives would attach like right here, and um, you know printers would attach here, and all your other peripherals would just plug into the back. Uh, but this was probably the other iconic 1980s computer. There, there were, the 1980s was a great decade for computing because there weren't just two platforms like there are now. Right now there's just Mac and Windows, and that's basically it. Um, back then, there was Commodore, there was Apple, there was Amiga, Atari, and a whole smattering of other business-oriented computers. So it was really great because there was a wide variety that you could choose from. And your friends might have different kinds of computers, and you could talk to them and compare notes and see who's got better graphics and who's got better um, programmability. And, you know, it was, just, it was just fantastic, I thought. And uh, plus, the computers were relatively simple. You could... The, the Apple IIe literally shipped with the schematics and technical documentation about how it worked so that you could build expansion cards yourself if you had the resources to do that. You could learn how to plug things into it. You could learn how to modify the, uh, the operating system. So, you know, it's all stuff you can't do these days anymore because computers are just too complicated. Um, <laughs> Abdul says, it looks like just a keyboard, right? Right, but, well, but the computer's inside. Right, if you look, if you look closely, you can see the board right here. These are they expose the edges of the board and some connectors. So there is a computer inside here, and it just the board just fills up uh, underneath the keyboard, the space underneath the keyboard. The is it the Raspberry Pi four hundred? Is kind of a throwback to that. Have yeah, you, it's the whole thing is inside the keyboard. Mm -hmm. Exactly. But, you know, the computer part's a lot smaller than the Commodore. And a lot more powerful. <laughs> and, yeah, infinitely more powerful. Well, I wouldn't say infinitely, but... <laughs> but 
a million times. Yeah. And, you know, consumes less power and more reliable and, um, here's, here's what you're talking about is this yeah. Raspberry Pi 400 and, you know, it's just a keyboard. It appears to be a keyboard, but inside is the, is the little board for the computer. And of course that board is only about this big. But you're right, kind of a kind of a throwback to the old Commodore 64 um, philosophy of just giving you the unit with the computer and then a bunch of connectors on the back for attaching peripherals. And what does this cost? About a hundred dollars, I think. Something like that, if you can get them. Yeah, There's still supply shortages. Um, but yeah, a hundred dollars for this, and. You know, like you said, a, a million more times powerful than the computer w that would have cost ten thousand dollars back in, you know, using equivalent money for today. Um, is it Sangi says that's a sweet collection. Oh, I got more than that. Uh, let's see, what do I got in here? I got the Apple IIgs. I got the Mac SE. What I'm what I'm aiming to do, and <laughs> right, I'm in my fifties and. You know, some people go through their midlife crisis and they buy motorcycles or convertibles or boats, right? And I buy my old computers. <laughs> um, so I've got the Apple II GS. I'm, what I'm aiming for is what were kind of the quintessential computers for that specific model line or for that era. And when I went to college, I had a Mac Plus, which looks kind of like that one back there, but was older. But once I got into college, this Mac SE 30 came out and I went, that's the one I really want. I couldn't afford it. That one was ridiculously expensive when it came out. I think the retail price on that computer was about $4,000, um, which in today's money, again, would be about $8,000 or more. And this, you know, a co poor college student, I couldn't afford that at all. But I, I drooled over it and that's the one I wanted. When I was in high school, I wanted the Apple II GS, but my family got the Apple IIe. Um, in my closet over there, I have a Mac LC2, which was, uh, I would say, early 1990s. It was one of the first color Macintosh computers. It wasn't the first, but it was one of the first. And it was um, a small, what we call a pizza box factor, so form factor. So it's about two inches high and then kind of squarish. And then the monitor sits on top of it. And then in there also I have a Power Mac G3, which was one of the last Power Macintosh computers that used the, uh, the RISC chips from, uh, from IBM. And um, that one is kind of interesting to have because it was one of the last computers that was able to support floppy disks and CDs and zip disks and Ethernet and serial and USB. Um, so it was a, it's a good bridge computer for someone who's into vintage Apple computing because you can plug in peripherals to it or built, has built-in peripherals that are able to talk to old hardware and to new hardware. See, the problem right now for some of the hobbyists that are into collecting these computers is that there's no way to get the, the Mac SE30 there on the internet directly because it doesn't have an ethernet port on it. Uh, it only has serial ports. So you've got to build some kind of device that can bridge the serial port to the Ethernet port. And such devices did exist. In fact, um, I have one on the floor somewhere over here. Um, but also, the web browsers that you can get for that don't support modern HTML and CSS and JavaScript, and they don't support SSL, the secure stuff. So it, it's very difficult to get them on the Internet because the, the processor in them just simply can't do the kinds of things that modern processors can do. They're just, they're just too slow and not enough memory. Um, so, it, you know, it's a challenge. Oh, how was the internet back then? Well, first of all, the internet didn't exist prior to about 1995. So there, there's that, right? So when you're looking at a computer like this, there was no internet. The, the way that you could transfer files or, or get access to talking to other people was through something called a bulletin board system, which is, I guess, kind of like the retro version of, let's say, Discord. 
to use a modern analogy, in that anyone could, with their own computer, set up a basically a server, and then you hook up a modem to it, and then people, other people would use their modems and make a phone call to your computer, and that makes a connection between the two computers, and then the bulletin board software would do things like allow you to post messages, read messages, talk to other people. But really, most bulletin board systems could only accommodate one user at a time. So one person would get on, read the messages, respond to them, and then log off. And that would open up the phone line for someone else to call. And then they would log on for a while and use it. And while that one person was using the bulletin board system, no one else could use it. Because, well, you're not familiar with this, but you used to get what's called a busy signal. You ever heard that on old phone lines, right? That, that beep, 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 beep to indicate that, that someone else is using the phone. Um, you, you would get that. And that means, oh, if someone else is using the bulletin board system right now. I just got to wait. So you wait five minutes and try again. And if you still got the busy signal, you wait five more minutes. Um, you know, and that was, that was life back then before the Internet. And then... And meanwhile, your parents are yelling at you to yeah. get off the phone line. Or, or worse yet, someone would pick up the phone. And again, right. this is not something that people can experience these days, but you're home might have had one phone number but multiple telephones in it and all of them use the same phone number does that like make sense right so there might be a phone in the kitchen and then one in let's say your parents bedroom and one in the hallway and one in the tv room right you might have like four telephones four physical devices but they all share the same phone number so when someone called that phone number all four phones rang at the same time which was great because there was no missing the phone call. Um, and then anyone who picked up, the first person who picked up a phone would start talking to whoever was you know, on the other end. And that meant also that if you were talking to grandma, everyone could join in because you would just say, okay, dad, you go pick up the phone in the kitchen and mom, you go pick up the one in the hallway and you know, Sally, you go pick up the one in the, in the den. And, and, you know, and you know, you'd send everyone off to go pick up one of the telephones and everyone can talk to grandma at the same time. You can't do that these days, can you? Well, I mean, like, you can all, like, squeeze into the same frame and FaceTime, right? But it's not like everyone can be in their own rooms, on their own phones, all talking to the same person. So we do, you know, all have our own devices now, but we kind of miss that old day of everyone can be talking simultaneously to the same person. You know, like I said, you can all squeeze into the same FaceTime window, but that's not, not quite the same thing. You all have to be in the same place, right? Um, I heard someone talking about a computer that used coax cable to get software, but that computer failed because no one liked that feature. You know, um, I'm trying to think. There, there was a very early um, attempt to get computers into some kind of public network. And I guess the idea was, I mean, you know, the details are a little fuzzy, but I seem to recall back in the 18, 1980s or 1990s, there was like a service where you could hook up your computer to your cable, the, you know, the cable television and basically, the computer had a, a box that would tune to a specific channel. And over that channel, some data would like be sent down to your computer, and you could somehow like respond to it. But not in the way that you can now, where you can bring up a web browser and just start surfing the web. But like, it, you could say, like, I want to find out about the current weather. And it would send you that information, and then you could respond to it somehow and say, okay, now I want to see the latest headlines. And then it would send you that stuff. But it would appear basically on a television rather than on a computer, I, I think. Anyway, the, the f it seems like there was something like that back in the 80, 1980s. But a totally different experience than we have now. Okay, so so getting back to what I wanted to do, which was Take a look at Advent of Code. So this is the 2022 website. If you just go to advent.code, adventofcode.com, here's the address. And 
and you bring it up, you will see a website that looks like this. And it says here, first puzzles will unlock on December 1st, midnight. That's 9 p.m. my time. Um, and then once, and so it's in about 11 hours. And once that happens, you'll be able to click on puzzle number one, and you'll get the instructions for it. The, uh, the way this works is it gives you, well, actually, what we can do is we can just look at some, some previous years. All you have to do is put slash and then put a year on here. Let's look at 2020. We'll go back two years. And then we can just click on number one. <coughs> so all the puzzles here are holiday-oriented. And this one here says... Um, after saving Christmas five years in a row, you decided to take a little break at a nice resort on a tropical island. Surely Christmas will go on without you. The tropical island has its own currency and is entirely cash only. The gold coins used there have a nice little picture of a starfish. The locals just call them stars. None of the currency exchanges seem to have heard of them, but somehow you'll need 50 of those coins by the time you arrive so you can pay the deposit on your room. To save your vacation, you need to get all 50 stars by December 25th. Collect stars by solving puzzles. Two puzzles will be made available to you on each day of the advent calendar. The second puzzle is unlocked when you complete the first. Each puzzle grants one star. Good luck. Before you leave, the elves in accounting just need you to fix your expense report. Apparently something isn't quite adding up. Specifically, they need you to find the two entries that sum to 2020 and then multiply those two numbers together. For example, suppose your expense report contains the following numbers. On this list, the two entries that sum to 2020 are 1721 and 299. Multiply them together, and you'll get 514,579. So the correct answer is that number. Of course, your expense report is much larger. Find the two entries that sum to 2020. What do you get if you multiply them together? Uh, to play, please log in. So I'll go ahead and log in. I'm, I'm logged in now. Um, so it says, to begin, get your puzzle input. So here is my expense report. You see it's a lot more numbers. And so the, uh, the goal here is find the two numbers in that list that sum to 2020, multiply those two numbers together, and then paste the answer into this box. Now, everyone who plays this gets a different input. So um, you can't just take your friend's answers and plug it into the box and solve it for yourself. You've got to actually solve the problem yourself. So what I want to do today is we're going to solve this puzzle using C in our modern development environment. And then we're going to see what it's like to solve this same puzzle on one of these 8-bit computers. So let's give it a try. So we need to write a program that is given a list of numbers as input and then figures out which two numbers sum to 2020. Now, how would you tackle this problem? Now, one thing to keep in mind is we only have to solve this puzzle once, right? We only have to find the answer and then plug it in. So we could either spend a lot of time trying to come up with a solution that works fast and is very efficient, or we could come up with a solution that just works. It may not be the fastest in the world, but it works and it gives us the answer. So how would you tackle a problem like this? You're given a list of numbers and you need to find the two numbers in there. And it's not necessarily the first and the fourth. You know, it could be the, the hundredth and the two hundredth number. You need to find the two numbers in there that sum to 2020. Any ideas? I mean, just kind of do it by brute force. Grab the first number, add it to all the other numbers. And if none of them work, grab the second number. So grab the first the number the and then loop through the rest of the numbers and try to add them and see which ones sum to 2020. If none of them do, then grab the second number and then loop through the remaining numbers, right? Yeah. Right, and just kind of brute force try every possible pair of numbers and see which ones sum to 2020. And, you know, that'll get the yeah. job done. And certainly yeah. there might be a, a way to do it, you know, using dynamic programming techniques that can reduce the number of choices quite a bit. But 
I mean, this will get the job done. And although yep. this list is quite long, I'd say on a modern computer, it will take just a fraction of a second to solve this problem. So let's go ahead and try that. So if, if it's something you had to do a million times, then maybe you would sort them and yeah. use that but to, we only have to do it them. once. Yeah. Just doing the pr problem is probably faster than sorting it. So we need to get the um, input numbers put into an array. And then we need to uh, loop through array. And then we need to like loop through array again. Sum each pair. See if they add to 2020. So let's, let's do this part here. Now, I, I know how long this input is. I can, just, I can just count the number of numbers. In fact, let me just copy and paste this, and I'll put it into, like, sublime text. And I'll just paste them in. And it says right here that there are 200 numbers. So I really don't have to do anything fancy with malloc and realloc and opening files and stuff like that. I could just create an array with 200 entries in it, and just write a loop that just reads the numbers in from standard input. Just paste them in, and then um, and just go from there. Right? Remember, the goal is just to, to solve the problem, not necessarily to do it the best way possible. So here's my array that holds 200 integers, and then I need like a count. So we'll say while count is less than 200. And really, actually, I could just write a loop. No, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that as a define up here. And the reason for that is because I want to be able to run this program on the small input with five numbers or six numbers and just make sure it works before we give it to the, the big input. So we'll for int i equals oops, int i equals zero. i is less than the length. I plus plus. And then we'll just go scan F percent D um, array sub I and then put ampersand in front. Okay, so that should get all numbers into the array. And now we just need to do you change the um, what's that? Where you define your array line seven, change that two hundred to len. Ah, yeah, thanks. So now we'll just go for int i equals zero. i is less than length. i plus plus. And then for the inner loop, like the outer loop is going to go through each of the numbers one at a time. So if we pick the first number, the second loop doesn't have to start from zero. It could actually start from the next number and go up to the top. Right, because because let's say we don't we, let's say we don't find the match for seventeen twenty one, and we then on the outer loop then goes to nine hundred seventy nine. Um, from that point, the inner loop can just start with three hundred sixty six. It doesn't have to go back and do seventeen twenty one again, because we already did that one. That was the first one we did. So our our second loop, our inner loop, can actually start from i plus one. It can start with the next number. And we say if array sub i plus array sub j is equal to 2020, and let's say uh, found percent d plus percent d,
and then we'll say uh, um, percent D times percent D equals percent D. <laughs> Actually, let's do it like this. Let's go int uh, product equals, not produce, product equals a race of i times a race of j. Yeah, kind of like that. That should be it. I think so. You want to exit after that because otherwise it'll still. Oh, yeah, true. Continue the loops. And you probably wouldn't know it, it would be so fast. True, yeah. Uh, there's a comment here Can we scan the numbers from a text file rather than entering them manually? That's what I'm actually going to do next. I'm going to put these uh, into a file, so I don't have to keep copying and pasting. But let's just let's just see if that works. Okay, so we knew we were going to read in six numbers. It found 1721 plus 299, and the sum is 514,579, which, if I recall, is exactly the number we're looking for. So pretty confident that this program is working. So let's go back and let's change this so that we get the input from a file rather than just copying and pasting the numbers in. So let's go like, um, I, I, what I'll do here is I will maybe get the name of the, the, the file from the command line, I guess. But we're still going to have to tell it how many entries there are. I mean, I could do something like open the file and count the entries, and that'll give me my array, right? But uh, how about how about this? How about we'll we'll give it the <laughs> we'll give it the the number of entries as the first command line argument and the file from the second command line argument. We would do it that way. All right, um, what do I got to do here? So I don't know how big this is. Ah, so we'll do int length equals, and then there's a function called a2i that'll take a string, an ASCII string, and turn it into an integer. And we'll just pass it argv1. And I can just put length here, length here. I could have just called my variable length, len. That would have solved some problems. And then get the input. So let's go file pointer in equals f open. argv2 for reading. Let's just make sure we got it open. Okay, so we got it open. Now we'll just do F scan F. You're missing an equal sign on line 11. I'm missing a what? Equal sign on line 11. Thanks. Like my human Your compiler. Your preprocessor. My human compiler is at work here. OK, how's that look? We got the file open. And we're just going to go to length, do F scan F, read it in, and then we just got to close the file.
8.out out, 6. Oh, let's make our data file. Let's call this AOC1 um, sample.txt. That's going to be these six numbers. And then here is the real stuff. AOC1 data.txt. All right. Let's try this. A dot out six AOC one sample, and it found it. That's the right answer. Um, okay, let's try it with two hundred. Ah, like I said, found it really quick. Uh, 528 plus 1492, and the answer is this. So we go over here, paste that in, submit, and it says that was right. Okay, part two. The elves in accounting are thankful for your help. One of them even offers you a starfish coin that I left over from a past vacation. They offer you a second one if you can find three numbers in your expense report that meet the same criteria. What are the product of the three entries that sum to 2020? So it's pretty much just this program, but with three loops. Let's do a uh, save as. Let's call this AOC um, 1 2. First day, number 2. So we just need three loops here for int k equals I uh, can do j plus 1. Don't really need this line. Because I'm just going to, I'm going to see them right here. I think that's it. Um, for my sample, we know that this is going to be the answer. Oh, I can see there's potentially going to be a problem here. Do you see it? No. Uh, no. I mean, these are the Oh, it might be more than an... It might be more than what an int can hold. Right? All these numbers here are like three digits long, except for a couple of them. But almost all the numbers here are four digits long. Well, but that's true. They have to add yeah, something to 2020, right? I don't know. Right. I'm, I'm still going to... I'm I, Well, let's run it like this. And if, it, if, it, if it's a problem, then we will um, change them to longs. So what... So the biggest it can hold is... Two billion, right? Yeah, or we could do unsigned int. Maybe that'll help. We could do unsigned. Okay, so is this the correct answer for our sample? Yeah. Yeah, it is. And that's a thing he'll do in Advent of Code is the sample works, mm -hmm. but then when you use real data, 
And can it see here, throws it, something in that you doesn't. Do a quick Oops. Sample. I, need to, I need to put 200 here. Yep, it worked. Now, wait, did it work? Yeah, I'm, I'm counting the digits. Well, here. we'll find out. Three, four, five, six. This is 262 million. It's not 2.6 billion. Oh, yeah, it's still worth it. So that seemed to have worked. That's the right answer. All right. Yep. We completed day one. Okay. So let's. So uh, what's always interesting in advent of code is if you look, day one in 2020 was messed up, so the leaderboard for day one doesn't isn't accurate. But in 2021, I looked at the leaderboard for day one, and the first the fastest person to get the first star took 28 seconds. What? And took and took a minute and seven seconds to get both stars. How? Uh, these people are like professional speed coders and they've, they've got everything already set up. It's amazing to, if some of them do um, like YouTube videos of, you know, streaming them, mm -hmm. programming them. And it's amazing to watch these people. I, I can't even read the problem a, statement in 28 seconds. Right. <laughs> Yeah, they just, they have this way, they just scan it real fast, and it's, like you said, it's really amazing. I, it's I, a whole different skill. Yeah, I, I suspect some shenanigans there. No, I mean, you can watch them. There's some, like I said, there's some who do it on, you know, they make a YouTube video of them doing it live. It's pretty cool. Yeah. That's not me. <laughs> it's never been me. Yeah, me neither. <laughs> I mean, I mean, some of them. I know there are programming languages out there specifically for solving these kinds of problems, and so they may already have set up libraries to like do this kind of stuff. You know, a library that's already set up to r read a file in and scan the file and compute statistics about it, so they can just you know, just to basically plug in the correct function. Does that make sense? Yeah. You know, like, you know, maybe if, you, if you've done Advent of Code long enough, you know what kinds of problems they tend to do is you just have to adapt problems you've seen before with the current problem. Anyway, so we want to, we want to basically write these programs, but on our 8-bit computer. Now, one of the other problems with these old computers is how do you how do you plug them into current video like right? there's there's no hdmi port on the back of this thing all it's got is one jack here an old rca style jack for plugging into a television and not even a television what's called a, a composite monitor it, it there were, there were basically two ways to hook up old computers. There was plug it into a television and then tune your television to either channel 2 or channel 3 or something like that. Or if you were lucky enough to have a monitor which didn't have a channel selector, then you could plug it straight into that. You get a slightly higher quality output from there. Um, but these days, a lot of the LCD displays just really can't accept this kind of input anymore. You might find one that does. But even then, it might not work because the, the video signal that these outputted was not really to spec. It was close enough to work with the displays at the time. But these current digital displays that we have just can't cope with these old, old analog outputs. Um, so there are various solutions that exist. And one of them is, is to get a device that actually pulls the composite output and then adapts it to HDMI. Um, another one, um, which which I personally have, is there's another card you can get that would that would plug into here, and the card would basically listen would would listen to the data bus, and any time it saw the computer writing to the area of memory that had to do with graphics or text, it would basically make a copy of that into its own memory, and then uh, that card actually has a little Raspberry Pi on it, and the Raspberry Pi has an HDMI output. And then the Raspberry Pi then outputs the display to HDMI. So that is, that's one solution. Um, and there's a variety of other solutions that are kind of similar to that. 
but it, it's actually, in many cases, just easier to run an emulator these days. You can go and get emulators that emulate these old 8-bit computers. And there's actually one uh, out on the internet. It, it runs entirely in JavaScript in your browser. So your browser, by the magic of JavaScript, is emulating all the hardware of an old computer. And uh, let me see if I can find that. Is it right here? So here's the address for it. Skullandsteel.com slash apple slash e. And this is basically a you know <laughs> web web browser representation of, of the computer I was just holding. So right now what it's doing is it is it has it has turned itself on, and it is, and you can see the light here for disk one is on, and what it's looking for is a floppy disk to be inserted into the into the disk drive. And so, what you would have done back in the day, if you had one of those actual floppy or actual disk drives, <coughs> is here's one of those disk drives, and you would open up the door to it, and then take your five and a quarter inch floppy disk, slide it right in, and then close the door, and that would engage the read-write head onto the floppy disk surface, and it would start reading the data off of it. So that's what it's waiting for right now. It's waiting for someone to insert a disk. And this emulator does have some disks that you can use. You know, we got some logo, Pascal, fourth, um, got ProDOS. Which was a you know, it didn't come with an operating system, so you had to load an operating system off of floppy disk. And you know, there you go ready to type in a program. Now, you know, I could use this web browser emulator, but I'm actually going to use an emulator that I've got here. Same idea. Oh, and this one has sound, which is kind of nice. Let's see, do I have sound turned up on here? I guess I do. You can hear it now. <laughs> it's got sound effects that sound just like the disk drives. So it's waiting for me to insert a disk. So I'm going to virtually insert a disk, and I've got one right here. And then when you boot these systems up, it just drops you right into BASIC, right? You're just ready to go. It's, you know, unlike computers these days, when you boot it up and it wants you to launch a web browser or wants you to launch a word processor, or, you know, nowadays um, programming is kind of hidden from you, but in the old computers, programming was the default way to interact with the computers. So you, you boot it up, and it drops you right into a, a prompt here where you can start typing in a basic program. So if you've never programmed in basic before, um, it's a little bit different than programming in Java or C because you don't have an editor, and you don't have a compiler. You just type in the program, and then you run it. And since you don't have an editor, you need some way to indicate which lines go where. And you do that with line numbers. So every line you type in, you prefix with a number that indicates where in the program it should go. So here's your kind of basic hello world program. You give it a line number. And typically, you start at 10. Um, and then you can say print. Oh, <laughs> I just typed printf. <laughs> um, and you can type hello world. Press enter, and if you type list, you can see your program, and you can see that line 10 contains the command print, and then hello world, and then you can run it, and it, you know, displays that. Then if you want to print something else out, like you want to print something after the hello world, you go line 20, I type printf again. Um, this is basic. So we've got line 10. Print hello world, line 20, print this is basic.
And then, of course, you know what people usually do is, you know, make it loop over and over again. So the basic looping construct in BASIC is called loop, or it's called go to. There's also for loops, and we'll get to that in a moment here. So now you can see the program uh, will print hello world, print this is BASIC, and then line 30 says go to line 10, and it just repeats over again. I'm going to press Control-C to stop it. How do you delete a line? So if you want to delete a line, you just type in the line number you want to delete. Press Enter. And now line 20 is gone. And if you mistype a line, then you just type it over again. Okay, so we're going to tackle this program, the advent of code. We're going to do the first one. Where is it? This one here. The one where you just have to find the pair of numbers that, that uh, sum to 2020. So let's, let's, uh, let's do it kind of a, so I'm going to clear out the program here, new. We're going to say 10, print, how many numbers? Twenty. The way you get keyboard input is you say input, and then the variable that you want to put the input into. Now, variable names in BASIC, typically, we're just limited to one or two characters. Right? You're used to, in Java or C, being able to do variable names that can be one to as many characters as you want, but a typical basic implementation from the 1980s used one or two character variable names, which means you have to get kind of creative with your variable names, but it also puts a severe limitation on the number of variables you can use. So let's, let's make this just called um, n, it's the number of numbers. Okay, now we're going to write a loop that will read in n numbers and put them all into an array. So the next thing to do is create our array. Use that with the dim keyword. And you might recognize that from Visual Basic. If you've done any Visual Basic programming, to create an array, you use dim, dimension. And we'll call this uh, A. <coughs> and we'll say uh, it has n numbers in it. Oh, I think we use parentheses for this. Now, we'll go into a loop, so we'll say 4x equals 1 to n, 50, let's print out x, and then like a colon, I think we can do that, 60 input a bracket, and use parentheses for array notation, I think, <laughs> if I remember right. Input A uh, X 70 next X. All right, let me just make sure I got that right. How many numbers? Six. It seems to be working. Uh, one of the things I notice here is I want the input, like the cursor, to appear next to the number. And the way you do that is <clears throat> after your print, you put a semicolon on the end, and that means don't go to the next line. So I've got to type this all over again. Print how many numbers? Semicolon. And then 50, print x, this is print x, semicolon. Let's try that. How many numbers? <laughs> See, uh, notice I left the question mark off because I knew that when I did an input, it would put a question mark on there for me. So 6, all right, seems pretty good. All right, now we're going to do our loops. So we're going to go 4, 
i equals 1 to n. And then line 110 for j equals i plus 1 to n. Now, arrays in BASIC are, um, they can be indexed from 0, but typically you index them from 1. It actually allocates space for n plus 1 numbers. And so you can either index it from 0 or from 1, depending upon how you feel. So if a i plus a j is equal to 2020, um, you say then print found A, I, um, I think we just do space, A, J, what are we doing so far? Oh, the other thing is, the default size of the screen on an Apple was 40 columns wide and 24 lines, or 24 or 25, 24 or 25 lines long. But if you had one of those memory expansion cards in there, you could go for a total of 80 columns. And so the, the memory expansion goes into slot number 3. So you say PR number 3, and then you get 80 columns. So notice, same number of lines of text, but everything just got narrower. OK, let's go like line 200, next J and then 210. So the, the numbers don't have to be sequential. They just have to be in order, in the order that you want them, in the, you know, increasing. OK, six numbers. And let's put in the actual numbers. 1721, 979. Let me move this over. You can see it. 1721. 979, 366, 299, 675, and 1456. Ah. Oh, all right, we got a little error, but it found uh, 1721, 299. The, the numbers are scrunched together because I didn't put a space in between them. But that's, that's the idea there. So we got a bad subscript error, AIAJ. happened. The loop kept the loop kept going and it maybe it yeah is it's got one larger. Yeah, but it goes from one to but should it be n minus one no, I guess it's I mean, uh, the loops in basic counted from the beginning right. number to the end number. It wasn't like in C where you count to one less than the end number. Oh, is it? It's because um, J is I plus one, so it gets oh. to be N plus one. Oh, right. Because I don't, I don't abort out of the program. The loops go to completion, and yeah, J goes too high. So we'll we'll fix that. Uh, first thing I gotta do is 120. If A I plus A J equal to 2020, then print found. Uh, we'll just do it like this. We'll just go a i times a j equals a i times a j. And then we wanted to do something else where um, uh, how do we uh, well uh, you know what I could do <laughs> we type it again if a this this was like you know could, you got used could you could you um 
in 100 for i equals 1 to n minus 1? Because you never need that to go to n. Oh, okay. That might be a and then that would fix it. Or i equals 1 to n minus 1. Sixty six, two hundred ninety nine, six hundred seventy five, and one, four, five, six. There. Okay, so we want to run this program now on like the the big one. And the problem is how do we get all these numbers into the computer? You know, given that it's not connected to the internet. Um, but I think through the magic of the fact that this is running on an emulated computer, we can copy and paste. So when I paste into the emulator, it's like I'm typing really, really fast. So I could do this two ways. I could, I could do the same thing. I could say there's 200 numbers, and then I could literally just paste in all 200 numbers, or we could put them into a file. Uh, variables, are, are they case sensitive and basic? Yeah, typically, they were not case sensitive. So um, notice everything's getting converted to uppercase. So although I typed the variable name in lowercase, it comes out in uppercase. So it just, um, it just, uh, it doesn't care about the case. So I guess let's, let's do it. Let's just copy this in. Let's try running the program. Oh, where am I? I'm over here. Here we go. Run. 200 numbers. And then we're going to go paste as text. Here we go. Uh-oh. You selected copy. Ugh. <laughs> I would never have caught that. Paste. You can see the computer is not that fast. This is a, a blazingly fast one megahertz processor. So <clears throat> we're looking at about two or three times, three, two or three thousand times slower than today's computer. All right, now it's running the loops. So we might have a problem here. We might have a problem in that the largest num well, first of all, in, in at least in Apple Basic, um, the numbers are stored as, I think they're 16-bit numbers, or they're floating point numbers. So the default calculation on here is a floating point number. So although we're typing in integers, it's converting them all into floats. And so we may never actually find the answer because of rounding and because it just exceeds the size of the numbers. Yeah, the <laughs> comment is they even emulate how slow the computer was. Yes, they do. Although we can, we can change the speed. We can change it to like four times as fast and then go as fast as possible. Let's, let's speed it up. Oh, there it is. It found it. There it is. Right. That was the correct that was the correct answer, right? Yeah, I think that was. Um, yeah, I remember the 1492. So there was a question here which was was Vim not even invented yet? No. Vim didn't. <laughs> Vim didn't. Well, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, it didn't it wasn't a Vim at all. No. <laughs> Well, I, you know, Vim or its predecessor, VI, which ran on Unix systems, did exist, because Unix systems did exist back in the 1980s. It's just that that was just way beyond the capabilities of these home computers. So 
VI did exist. It just didn't run by default on these systems. It didn't come with anything like that because, you know, that wasn't the target audience. All right, so <laughs> we found the answer. Um, but now we want to expand this to work on the, uh, the larger problem, which is to find the three numbers. <laughs> this is probably going to take forever, right? Um, so I need to have a third loop. The third, so I got i going from 1 to n minus 1. I got j going from i plus 1 to n. And now I need a third loop. I need my k loop to go from j plus 1 to n. And I just need to squeeze it in between lines 110 and 120. So I'm going to put in a line number that is just in between 110 and 120. For k is equal to j plus 1 to n. And if I do a list, we can see it is now sitting in between those lines. And then I need to now, <laughs> you know, redo this as well. So um, 120. Actually, let's do it like this. Let's go, um, let's do 120 sum equals a i plus a j plus a k. And then we'll do 130 if sum is equal to 2020. Then print a i and then a multiplication symbol a j and then a multiplication symbol a k then an equal sign. Oh, I should have had a line that does the product. Nah. Well, you can still just type product and then put the line in, right? That's true. Yeah. And then I, I wanted to basically stop the program at that point. So I think I can use, would it stop? I don't remember. So the way you separate uh, two statements on the same line was with a colon. So if this is true, then do this and do this. Okay, and then 100, like 125 will go product equals a i times a. And I might get myself into a little bit of trouble here because. We only need the product if the sum works. But the way I've got it written here, it's going to compute that product every time, whether or not it needs it. So this could significantly slow down my program. Wait, you need a next K. Oh, you're right. Um, like 190, 199? Sure. Next K. And then uh, we probably need to mess with the ranges for the for loops to avoid subscript errors again. I would be N minus two. Mm. J would be N minus one. Uh oh. I just overwrote 100, line 110. Oh, well, we're going to have to rewrite that one anyway. 2 n minus 2, 110 for j equals i plus 1 to n minus 1. Yeah. Um, do you use rem to write a comment like in batch files? Yes. That's exactly the same. All right. Uh, let's do six numbers. Pull off these six right here. There we go. That's it. That's the answer. And then that stop made the program just you know, terminate at that point. 
Okay, let's try it. 200 numbers. Uh, there's a comment here that says, it looks like GDB. Well, I can see the similarity, right? Because it's all command, essentially command line driven. And, you know, you're, you're kind of like looking at the lines of code as you're running it. So I could see that being similar. Okay, now this is going to take forever, right? So let's speed it up. Yeah, with that multiplication in there. It's still, it's still taking forever. I mean, this really kind of points out how how important it could be to choose the right algorithm. Like, you know, these days on these computers, it's like, who cares if we're doing this brute force, right? It only takes a fraction of a second. But on this computer that's 5,000 times slower than the than current computers, it really matters. You know, maybe is there a better way to do this? Now, one of the problems with BASIC is you don't have recursion. So if you come up with a recursive solution that's faster, you're going to have to do something different there. Um, if you want to write multiple lines inside an if statement, do I need to use, use end if? No, you, there's no end if like that. You have to put everything you want to do on the same line. So we could maybe, if the sum is not 2020, skip, you know, go to the after oh, the product. Yeah. Oh, there it found it. Oh, it got it. But remember, I okay. was going at hyper speed. Yeah, how, this, right? how fast how fast is that? That that's basically like as fast as the emulator will go. Okay. I think if you if you drag it over there and then hover over it, does it tell you how fast it is? Because remember when you had it there, yeah, it says that's the speed of the original. So if you scroll it all drag it all the way to the right. It said over here. Maximum speed, high speed, maximum speed. It doesn't say. Well, maybe it'll say it if you hover over the slider. Run as fast as possible, except when generating okay. sound. Okay. Well, so the emulator is just cranking out the cycle okay. as fast as it can. So you're right. So I could do something like 121 if sum uh, is, is I do not equal to, I think? Oh, yeah. Sum not equal to 2020. Uh, then go to 199. Yeah. <laughs> it's basically kind of like negating this whole thing here, right? <laughs> oh, right. Then, yeah, 130 would just be print. 130 would just be print out those the answer. Things. Right. Yep, type it all over again. And. That's the definition of spaghetti code. Uh, is this a is this an interpreted language like Python? It's even more interpreted than Python. At least what at Python, when you run your code, there's a, a brief pause as the Python interpreter goes through your code and kind of makes a first pass at it, learns things like the names of your functions, names of your variables. Does a syntax check on it, make sure it, you know it looks okay. And in basic, when you type run, it it literally starts from line ten and goes from there. So I could have a syntax error in let's say line one hundred and thirty, and if one hundred and thirty is never executed, I will never see that syntax error because it it interprets things as it goes. Let's do six to begin with. Just make sure it's all working. All right, that worked. All right, that's really kind of the only way to find syntax errors is just to run it. So I don't want to run it on the big big input and have to wait through 200 lines and then find out there's a syntax error somewhere. Um, and and there's, there's other issues with the way that this basic is implemented. 
and that is the lines are stored internally as a linked list. So they go into memory in the order that I typed them in. You remember I typed in line 199 and you know 121 later on. So those would actually physically be laid out later in memory than you know some of the later lines that I typed in earlier. But that's okay. It's a linked list, right? So it, it just it's just hopping through memory and memory is random access. So it doesn't take any longer to access this section of memory as it does this section of memory. So that's not necessarily a problem. What it is a problem is when I do something like a go to. Right here, go to 199. Um, line 121 has no idea where line 199 is. So when you do a go to, it has to start at the top and follow the linked list down until it finds a line 199. And then it starts executing from there. And the nice thing about a linked list is that once I'm done with 199, it can just go to the next line, right? It's got a link to the very next line. But anytime you've got a go to and a line number or a, a go sub, which is used to call functions or call subroutines, it has to count like from the top going down. Same thing here, next K, next I, J, and next I. It doesn't know where these loops began. It doesn't know where the K loop is. So it has to start at the top and you know, go its way down until it finds the loop for K. And then it knows where that loop is. And then when it got a next J, it doesn't know where J is. Doesn't know where the top of that loop is, so it's got to start at the top, you know, to find its way down, and then go to that one. So that slows down your interpretation a lot. So there was a lot of work done by programmers to try to optimize their programs. Like, put your subroutines up near the front of the program rather than near the back of the program, just so that the search for the line number would go faster. Um, other things like like numbers. We've got numbers in here, like 1, 2, 20, 20. Uh, those are not stored in your program as integers. They're stored in there as a sequence of characters, basically a string. So this 2020 is stored as the, the ASCII characters 2020, not the integer 2020. Uh, what that means is that when your program is interpreting it, it has to turn this string into a number on the fly. <laughs> Right? So every time we're running this program and we're doing this if, it has to convert that number into an integer. It has to run a little loop that like takes all the characters and turns them into an integer. So we can actually make the program go faster if we put this 2020 into <coughs> a variable. <laughs> uh, so it doesn't have to convert every time. But anyway, let's, um, let's run this program. And then we're going to do 200 numbers. Is that what we're trying to fix? Oh, we're going to see if it goes faster. Yeah, we're trying to skip the product. What was the point of basic language? It was so limited to other languages at that time. Well, one was it, it came with the computer. So when you bought the computer, typically it came with a book that said, like, here are some programs you can type in to start trying to use your computer. You could write some simple games, you could write some simple programs to, let's say, you know, add up all the numbers in your checkbook. Because BASIC was the way you interacted with the computer. If you wanted to run a program that you bought and, you know, bought the floppy disks and brought it to your computer, you would turn on the computer and go into BASIC and then type run and then the name of the program, right? So BASIC was the way to interact with the computer, kind of like how when you log into a Linux system, you get a command prompt, and that's the way you interact with that Linux system. Now, these days, of course, you have the graphical user interface, but back in the 1980s, 1990s, when you logged into a Unix system, you just got a command prompt. And typing in commands was how you got the computer to do things. Um, a basic interpreter also can fit into just a few kilobytes of memory, whereas to uh, get like a C compiler or a Pascal compiler would take up you know multiple diskettes of data and, and programs to use it. I have I have a pa actually I have Pascal right here, and just to even get a simple Pascal system requires two diskettes. One contains the editor and one contains the compiler, and not much space left over for your programs. 
So the first thing the Pascal programmer would do back then was kind of build their own Pascal development system that contained just the tools and utilities they needed for their program so that you would have space left over for your program itself. There, found it. Was that faster? Well, actually, I don't know. We, we bumped the speed up here. So if I wanted to make this, you know, go as fast as possible, I would maybe put this 2020 into a variable. So maybe like line five, I would go T equals 2020. And then on line 21, I say if sum is not equal to T, then go to 199. That would maybe go a little bit faster. Uh, we're not calculating the product. And then another thing that goes faster, it makes it go faster, is here where I say next k, and I, and I told you earlier that it has to go up and find out where the loop for k is. So it has to start from the top of the program, scan down until it finds the loop for k, and then it knows what line to go to to go to the next increment. Uh, same thing for j and i. Um, but the implementation for basic, the way this particular one works, is every time you run a loop, it keeps a it stores in memory, you know, like the where the loop started and what's the current count of the loop. So I can actually speed things up here if I just say next instead of next k. Same thing for line two hundred and two ten. So what this will do when I just say next is it'll just simply go to the 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 nearest loop, which in this case is the k loop, and it already keeps track of where that is. So by saying next k, I'm telling it, okay, I want to go the next increment of the k loop. But if I just say next, I say, I just want to go to the next increment of the current loop. And that'll run faster. <laughs> Same thing, where, where else we do it? Right here, line 70. I'll just say next instead of next x. And that'll make this loop run a little bit faster. Now, honestly, it's not going to appear to run much faster. Let's speed it up. There we go. <laughs> I wonder if there's people on YouTube and Twitch streams who solve advent and code in esoteric computing environments. Like, let's not try to go for the fastest solve possible. Let's just try to solve it, period, on a system with limited memory. I don't know if that was any faster. It's, I'm going to say it was faster. <laughs> I mean, it, it kind of depends upon when, I, when I bumped up this, no. uh, this, All right. this thing here. So in the chat, I pasted a YouTube video of somebody solving it, uh, this problem pretty quick. How, how long did it take him? It, it, I'm not sure because 2020 is the day where day one got messed up. Um, where is he? Yeah, I don't see him on the. Oh, well, it says six minutes and 53 seconds, but that's how long it took the server to respond. The fastest person did it in 35 seconds. But it probably took him less than a minute or around a minute. Um, does this computer have games on it? I do have some games on there. Ah, there we go. Now we're talking. Of course, I need to hook up my controller to it. Where did I put my controller? Ah, go. The nice thing also about an emulator is you can just use a standard USB controller. 
instead of the old joysticks, which I do have a box of somewhere around here. Oh, but now the problem is that I can't, on my modern laptop, I can't plug one of these USB A's into it. <laughs> Technology moves forward. I no longer have a USB A port on my computer. I need an adapter. I have one in my bag of goodies. There's one. So there's a <clears throat> there's a fellow out there. His hacker name is 4AM. And what he does is he finds these old 8-bit computer games. And a lot of them were protected in a way that made it hard to copy them. And so his job is to figure out how to make a copy of those old games. And he puts them all onto one giant, what, what seems to the computer like a hard disk image. Except the maximum size of the hard disk back then was 32 megabytes. That was the biggest you could make a hard disk. Um, but he's put about 200 games on there. So let me go ahead and called Total Replay. And pop that into the virtual hard disk. And we'll boot it up. And we'll go into color mode. Right here. Oh, 470 games. So one of the iconic games from the 1980s was uh, Choplifter. Mm -hmm. And there was a uh, Karataka and a uh, Droll. Of course, there's like Space Invaders and, you know, some of the common like Pac Man. So let me see. Um, let me make sure I've got my. That sound you hear is supposed to be the sound of popping the lid off the computer. Game controller found. All right, so we're going the Y direction there. Yep, X direction there. Good. And then what? What are my buttons? This is my button zero. This is my button number one. All right. I don't exactly remember what the point of this game was, except to just shoot at things. And somehow, like, ah, collect the balloons? I'm a lot of practice. Yeah, I'm not way out of practice on this. Let's let's go. Uh, let's see. Escape. Do I get back to the main menu? No. I just I, get, I think I just have to reboot. Reset. was another iconic game from back then. Your job is to go and rescue the... Of course, rescue the girl. You have to fight. Run. Yep. Run. Oh, well, we'll just go this way. And just kick your way through this. Kick and punch.
Uh, rebooting is very fast. Yeah, on these old computers, you just, I mean, you rebooted them all the time because that was how you got out of one program into another. All right, now there's a way to, a way to stand up and run. There it is. Now run. No. <laughs> <laughs> You put, move the joystick up, and then... No? Let's see, what was it? Was it this key? No. This one? No. Yeah, that makes him bow. Let's see, this button is punch. This button is kick. And then you can kick up, and you can kick down. Uh, and then you can punch straight, you can punch up, and you can punch down. And then to run, I thought it was up and then forward. Up, no. Up, stands up, and then... That's not what I want. I get it. Is that spelled right? No, Google. There Google's it is. changed it. Uh, let's see. Joystick control. Oh, right arrow on the keyboard. Yeah, but you can do it all from Maybe. the joystick. No. Now you move the joystick into the upper right hand side to run to the right. Oh, I need to. I know what I need to do. Let's go configure, um, built-in connections, game controller, calibrate. I think you have to click OK f first. Oh, is it? OK, never mind. Up. No. <laughs> Were you right, maybe? Machine. Move all the joysticks and sliders in your gamepad as far as they can go in all directions. Make sure all controls oh, are okay. in position. Then press OK. <laughs> so I know I'm sitting here wiggling this. Okay. Go in all the corners. So that's my Y. That's my X. Stand up. Run. Oh well. <laughs> So you have to get you have to run in order to get to the next guy, and he's he's way out there. So you got to figure out how to do this running thing. I'm gonna skip this here. <laughs> Is there a game called Jump? Does that? Uh, there's one called Joust. You think about Joust? Yeah. No. I'm trying to remember. Uh, my boss and I, when there was nobody coming into the store, we would sit and play games. And there was one that we just spent so much time on. And I, th I thought it was jump, but I could be wrong. There was no Super Mario back then. But there was Donkey Kong, which is, I think, where Mario makes his first appearance. Oh, yeah, we played a lot of Choplifter. This one, this, yep. Remember this one.
So the goal of shoplifters is to rescue the hostages and not get shot by the tanks and planes. I don't really need to shoot this tank. And of course, don't bomb the people. There. My yeah, score is, my score is four. <laughs> oh. oh. Yeah, that's an American flag on the base. Yeah. All right, we're out of here. Anyway, that's choplifter. And then, oh, there's like, um. Ah, gotta watch for those planes. There's also um, bunkers. I mean, it's not a complicated game, but, you know, it's fun. Uh, what else was on here? Um, they don't have load runner on here because load runner is one that requires saving, and this is a um, hard disk image is strictly uh, read only. Oh, oh lemmings. load runner is on here. <clears throat> This wasn't another enormous time suck for me. The goal is to collect all those little boxes, not get touched by the guys, and then when you collect your last box, a ladder will appear that goes all the way to the top. There's a couple more boxes to get. There we go. Come on, come on, come on. Oh, no. Yeah. <clears throat> Load Runner was also one of the first games that included a level editor. Oops, I paused it. So we had lots of fun, lots of fun making our own levels. I just want to get past the first level. up one of those boxes.
<laughs> Finally, on the level two. What's that turtle game? Did you see one on the as I was scrolling through, or were you thinking about like logo, the programming language? Did I find any bugs in these games? I'm sure there were. I wouldn't have known if they were. We'll call them features back then. Now the trick is get that box that is over, see where it's buried in there? I'm going to do it like this. Drill, drill, go in, drill, go in. Anyway, that's Load Runner. Oh, let's do maybe Conan. Now, of course, back then we didn't have flop, uh, didn't have hard disks, <clears throat> so you would have had like a, you know a game per floppy disk. You know, you're just swapping floppies every time you wanted to play a new game. Were all the games made using BASIC? You know, very few were made using BASIC. BASIC was just too slow. So a lot of games were written in assembly language. Like assembly, like they were programmed directly in assembly language. C wasn't really a thing back then. I mean, it, ex it existed. And I do have a C compiler for the Apple II computer, but uh, it was not typical to write them in C. Do I have Prince of Persia? Yeah, I've got that on here. I don't, I don't actually know how to play it. I wasn't a Prince of Persia person. Let's see, J for joystick usually? No? Control J, sometimes that works. No? Don't remember how to put it in joystick mode. That was the other thing, was, you know, joysticks were not something that everybody had. So games usually came with both keyboard controls and joystick controls, like they do now. But the default was not necessarily to use joystick, it was to use um, the keyboard. And usually there was a key, key to press to make put into joystick mode, like control J or J, but that doesn't seem to be working here. So somebody said Prince of Persia. Let's look at that. Before C, was there A and B? Uh, I believe there was a B language. I don't know about A. I believe there was a B. All right, what do I do here? Uh, what do I can do? Can I jump? No. Jump? Uh, oh, up to, up to jump. All right, up. Well, let's go down. <laughs> uh, 
Ah. <laughs> oh. So how do I how do I like jump across a Is it uh Oh. A, Don't want to go down there. Yeah. Is it this button? Nope. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, but how do how do I jump across the the gap? What button do I press to jump? Is it one? Is it like the button, or do I, do I go like go up? Oh, go left and then go up. Got it. Oh, I tried to go up. Oh, it does open, huh? Oh, I see. There's like a there's like a pressure plate or something. Yeah, I've clearly never played this game. That's right. I That is totally obvious. I have never played this game. What did that do? Ah. Uh, the creator of this game, Prince of Persia, has made a full documentary on YouTube. I have heard about that. I haven't seen it. Uh, James Mechner also did uh, Karataka, that karate, karate one I was showing you earlier. And he also did one called Earhart. So he was um, like one of the big, well-known game developers back then. There's Earhart. Oh, that's Dan Gorlin. I'm sorry, I got the names wrong. Oh, um, there was a Donkey Kong, I think. Gee, doesn't that look like Mario? sound that was that's kind of like what the apple was capable of i mean they, you know this is an early game the later games they got they figured out some programming tricks to get the sound better Price of Prince of Persia back then? I don't know. You know, I was like a lot of other people at the time. I didn't pay for my games. <laughs> I think I bought a few of them. Some money I had saved up, but for the most part, I didn't pay for any of them.
All right, that's enough of that. Uh, what was the, some of the other? Oh, there was, of course, there was, um, there was like Oregon Trail, which is not, I believe it's not on this. Uh, Battle Zone was another one that sucked up a lot of my time. Bolo, I love that one. Tank game. Did the console exist back then? Tell me more about that. I mean, uh, when you say console, give me an idea of what you're you're imagining in your mind. Castle Wolfenstein. Oh, it was the Atari Twenty Six Hundred. Oh, oh, you mean like game consoles as opposed to, um, <laughs> like, when I think of consoles, since I come from like the Linux world, I think of like, you know, sitting at the, the keyboard and a screen and typing stuff in, that kind of console. Yes, you, you did see Castle Wolfstein right there. Uh, this one I think can only be played on the keyboard, and I don't remember what the keyboard controls are. I tried to play this a couple months ago, and I was like, I don't remember what the keyboard controls are, and I got kind of frustrated and moved on. Centipede, there's Load Runner, Choplifter. This is one game where caps lock must be on. You cannot press lowercase letters because this this game dates back from the Apple II days. I have an Apple IIe that had uppercase and lowercase. The original Apple II only had uppercase. So there was no need to say, you make sure your caps lock is on because it didn't have that key. It was only uppercase. And so that was one of the things that frustrated me about playing Castle Wolfenstein as I, as I, as I said, okay, I can see here that I can use the keyboard but none of the keys worked. And then I, I had to Google around and say, oh, caps lock has to be on. Uh, so let's say the joystick will work. Let's say J. Oops. Um. Don't run into a wall. Uh, what do I do here? I want to open this chest. in the chest and I also don't remember how to aim your gun sorry I'm just wandering around trying to figure out how to how to do things like aim my gun and stuff like that try to press this button doesn't work try to press this button doesn't work this is movement, keys on the keyboard. No, this is not Wolfenstein 3D. This is Wolfenstein barely 2D. <laughs> and also, one of the things that kind of trips people up about playing these old games is 
these days, most game developers have, have standardized on WASD for doing your motion controls. Back then, there was no standard for that. Um, you know, since there were no like controllers that you held in your right hand, there was no need to use anything on your left hand specifically for motion control. So WASD was, was not most common. It was more like using maybe I, J, K, and L on your keyboard for motion control or maybe just the, the arrow keys. Or it could be something completely different from that. Let's see what we got here. Okay, so the, the keyboard motion controls were Q, W, E, A, S, D, X, Z, C. So almost like W, A, S, D. And the aiming keys were I, O, P, K, L, semicolon, period, comma, and slash. Or button one, fire gun, button zero, up for movement, down for aiming. Space bar opens chests. Control C to adjust controls. Control N to generate a castle. Button one, button zero. Yeah, the button should work. Huh. Oh, hold it down. Not that button, hold it down. Ah, hold down this button. And then, but, and then <laughs> with the, <laughs> with my, I'm, I'm using my thumb to hold down one button and then with the other part of my thumb, I can trigger the other button. go. <laughs> <laughs> that was some pretty impressive uh, voice simulation. Yeah, that, for, I mean, for back then, you could actually, they were actually speaking German, which was pretty, pretty incredible for back then. Uh, if I had more time, I could maybe learn that game some more. <laughs> but. Uh, I think Pac-Man is on here, but Pac-Man on the Apple was a pretty poor... Um, representation of like what most people think of being Pac-Man.
You know, it's not the song you recognize, right? I think when Miss Pac-Man came out, it was better gameplay. Well, maybe we'll do that one next. Oh, no. Do I have F1? Like, like the race car, race car game? Run away, you guys. Come on, just a few dots left. I can do it. Uh-oh. Go around this way. Go right here. Hope I don't get... Oh. Um, does this Pac-Man have... Well, can you plug in two joysticks? Uh, yes, you can. You can actually plug in two joysticks. But there was a limitation. Um, most of the joysticks had two buttons on it button zero, button one. Um, so the Apple supported two joysticks, but only three buttons. So if you, if you had a second joystick, you, as a game developer, you then had to figure out, how can I make it so that both players uh, only needed one button? Because you couldn't give both players two buttons. And also, for the most part, a lot of these games, uh, the computers just didn't have enough processing power to really adequately support. Oh, there's Mario Brothers. Look at that. Um, they didn't really have um, enough processing power to really adequately support two simultaneous players. I guess let's go to Mario Brothers. Now, again, this is not a game that I played, uh, you know, when I was a kid. So forgive me if. It appears like I have no idea what I'm doing. Do the the, the Pac-Man's had some kind of AI, you know, I think for Yeah, Mario is using joystick and Luigi is using keyboard. One player Sound on, return, space to start. Um, yeah, they did have like a rudimentary, rudimentary AI. But you know, you, you, since those characters had names, right? You, you knew how Inky was going to behave and Blinky was going to behave. Mm. Nope. How do I get out of here? Do I just have to get all the turtles? So obviously you don't get the turtles by landing on them. Oh, that's right. You got to get them from below. Now I remember. There. Wonderful sound effects. It's really grating on my ears now. The other thing Apple didn't have was it didn't have a volume control. Um, sound was either on or off. It, it just only came in one volume, loud or non-existent. So a lot of people, that was one of the things that kind of modded their computer was to add a little volume control to the speaker so that at least you could turn down the sound or mute it. So, get 
the turtle. <laughs> That's it, right? You know, you just repeat the level over and over again. So, Super Mario, it is not. Yeah, so early games, the, the graphics were really limited. And as the years went on and programmers worked more with the hardware, they started learning more tricks about how to get the most performance out of the games. So a lot of the early games had a lot of the flickering because they hadn't yet kind of figured out the whole double buffering thing that we now take for granted, which is you you paint the current screen on in an area of memory that's not being shown on the screen. And then at the right moment, you then uh, hide the current screen and show the one that you've been drawing on. And then you just flip back and forth between these two screens. It's called double buffering. Um, so early games didn't have that, so you saw a lot of flickering. And then later games, they had figured that out and done it, uh, it where they could do it fast enough that you could essentially eliminate all the flicker. Um, so early games had really rudimentary graphics. Later games had better graphics, better sounds, because they had figured out how to essentially click the speaker in more sophisticated ways than just simply playing tones. So things like the Donkey Kong and the Mario Brothers that you just saw, those were early games. And then things like the, the Karateka and Prince of Persia, those were much later. And the graphics were a lot smoother, the sound effects were more sophisticated. Even though you're using the exact same hardware, they just figured out better ways of using the hardware more efficiently. Do I have any 3D games? Well, you know, 3D games there back then were you know, not that impressive. Um, see if I can find one. Oh, how about this one? S. I have to go to ST. So what I do is I press, I press like one letter, and then I have to scroll through. I press like S to go to the S section, and then I have to scroll through and find the rest of them. Sky Fox was kind of 3D. Ish. Oh, this one had uh, stereo sound. Joystick select scenario and rank, button select submission. Alright, we'll do tank training one. Uh, I'm not sure what I'm doing here. Prepare to launch. The, the reason that this game is able to have stereo sound is it used an add-in card called the Mockingboard that contained its own sound chips. So because it's using that auxiliary sound card, it's able to then use more of the CPU for doing things like graphics and gameplay, and less for doing the sounds. Got one more, huh? Over here? Oh, he's under me. So who's shooting at me? Yeah, so this, this game is actually fairly sophisticated. Pretty good gameplay, pretty smooth graphics. show you an earlier one. I don't know what to do now. 
Escape. How do I get out of this? Tab. Return. Space. Oh, hey. Space changed my uh, radar view. Enemy gear disengage. Guided missile. Hmm. No target. Oh. That was X. Uh, escape help. T tactical display. Z for zoom. I, J, K, and M for moving. Autopilot. Score. Installation port. Ah, too much stuff for me to memorize right now. Almost there. SP, 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 SP. <laughs> I'm trying to get to ST. Here we go. Now STE. There we go. So this was an early 3D game. Spacebar to begin the mission. Uh, M for mission briefing. S to display high scores. Control J to select keyboard. Uh, Control J to select joystick. Control is set to joystick. Sound is set to on. Okay. So this is a 3D game in which like you know all of the graphics are being calculated on the fly so it's it's you know doing actual like 3D rendering onto a 2D screen of these well, wireframe forms right in front of me So unlike Sky Fox, which I'm guessing is is not like true 3D in the sense that it's rendering a 3D scene, it's really just two-dimensional shapes being displayed on the screen in such a way that it looks 3D. Whereas this Stellar 7 is actually, as far as I know, doing actual 3D calculations in order to display its wireframe graphics. And you can see it's a, you know it's a lot slower because it's doing all these uh, you know, matrix multiplications and things like that. There's a guy right behind me. There he is. Uh, you said this is actually better than the first one. The first, the the first version of this, or the the first game that we were playing, like the, the Sky Fox. Oh, better than Sky Fox? I, you know, I liked this game when uh, when I was playing it. I mean, you know, simple, crude, and kind of fun. Come on! Now, as as far as I know, there's there's no way to like aim up. Oh, I don't know what that did. There must be a way to aim up. I just not remembering what it was. Oh, maybe my shield. Maybe those are my shields or something. 
<laughs> I pressed the other button on my joystick. I was like, what does that do? I don't know. Got him. And the other thing I liked about this game was the playing field was vast. Right? You see those mountains way over there? You can eventually get to them. If you drive forward long enough, I think you'll eventually get to those mountains. And then you'll be able to like go in between them. Oh, he's shooting at me. So unlike Sky Fox, in which you can fly forever and the scenery looks exactly the same, um, in, in Stellar 7 you can actually drive around and go places. But this was an early, early, uh, early game. I'm almost out of ammo and stuff. You can see my indicators on the <clears throat> on the the right hand side are going down. Uh, I think this running in front of me is that a. Is that the end of uh, level thing, or is that a refill thing? I don't remember. We're going to drive toward it. Ah, end of level. Well, that's Stellar 7. Well, I need to actually wrap things up here. It's 12 o'clock our time. Um, so that was a little introduction to <laughs> retro computing back from the 1980s using you know computers that I grew up on. And I kind of like the idea of solving some of these advent of code problems using the older computers and um, seeing what you can do. You might, I might run into serious limitations with things like the amount of memory and the size of integers, but there are ways around it. Like if I, like if I break out the C compiler for the Apple II, then I can get around some of those issues because it does have 32-bit integers. It, it emulates them using the 16-bit registers, but it does have them. Hey. Oh, thank you. Um, and then I can also program them in Pascal uh, which I think only has 16-bit integers, but I was interested in, in um, implementing a arbitrary precision library in Pascal or, or C or something like that. I actually have the code for it. I just need to get around to doing it, but that, that might be an interesting project to do. So, I don't know, it could be something to do over the break, is do some of this old, like, write programs in BASIC and Pascal and some of these old 8-bit languages and just see how we do. Solve some of the advent of code problems and try it. So like I said, I do have to get going. Um, I have an appointment to get to in half an hour. See if I can get this strep throat taken care of. So that's it for today. All right. Good luck with the strep throat. Thanks. I mean, like other than, other than my throat feeling weird, I feel fine. That's one of the weird things. It's like, if it was a normal viral infection, I'd be like, oh, I'd be tired, I'd have a, you know, a stuffy nose, but I'm great. <laughs> Just except for the fact that swallowing is difficult. And one thing I noticed in the instructions for booking the, uh, the review appointment, mm -hmm. it says click on Confer Zoom in the sidebar. Um, yes, that's, that's one of the things that needs to be fixed. Is, oh, okay. Because I have to add that in. Okay. Great. So once once I have all the time slots in, then I'll I'll put that link in there. All right. All right then. Well, it's good seeing you. We'll be back on. Um, we'll probably meet briefly on Monday just to uh, 
you know, kind of touch bases and uh, have, wish everyone a you know, happy break and stuff, and then we'll go into our, our, uh, our meetings and stuff. Okay. okay. So take care, right. everyone. Have a good weekend. You too. Bye-bye. Right. Bye. Record. Oh, thanks for tuning in, everyone. I thought that was fun just to go and see some of those old computers. I would like to do more videos with the old computers that I've got. There are plenty of videos on YouTube by other folks, um, but I'd kind of like to do some of my own. And actually, maybe, you know, we can work with the emulator or I can hook up the actual hardware and feed it right into the, into my, um, you know, video switcher. Um, so that's some of my projects is, one, oh, actually, one of the projects that I have been working on, and I haven't had time since the summer to work on it, so it's kind of at a pause right now, is I said earlier that these old computers, they can't get on the Internet, right, because they don't have an Ethernet jack. They don't, you could use dial-up with the modem, but that was really slow. But the early Macs, like the Mac Plus and on up, had a rudimentary networking called Apple Talk, and it plugged into the serial port and then it had a little adapter that then you plugged what looked like phone lines into it. It was actually the kind of cables you use for old landlines. But you could make a, a rudimentary home network using these very inexpensive little phone net connectors. It didn't run very fast. It ran, I think, at 144 kilobits per second. So pretty slow. Faster than a modem, but slower certainly than Ethernet and slower than Wi-Fi. But you could get computers network that way and share files and share printers. It was really neat and it was nice because you could just plug in these connectors and then they would just work. You didn't have to configure them. You didn't have to go in and assign IP addresses. You just plug them in and the computers just discovered each other. Um, and then in the 1990s, along comes Ethernet and Apple does generate or develop a, a way to plug the Macs into Ethernet networks and get the same features of being able to auto discover other computers and share printers and share files. And you can get these bridge devices. And I, I, I found one fairly recently. Let me see if I can pull it out. Here it is. It looks like a little little manta ray. Um, but what it has is a serial port connector on one end. This is the old Mac style serial port, a little round connector. And then it's got Ethernet, an Ethernet port right here. So this acts as a bridge between the old style phone net connector, the old style local talk and the new style ethernet and i picked this up for like 20 bucks i found it at a surplus store but my project has been you know these are pretty rare you can't find a lot of them my project has been can i take a modern and inexpensive microcontroller like this which is the raspberry pi pico with an ethernet jack i found one online you can get with an ethernet jack and then write the software for this that will emulate the, the old serial connection. So it, it will act as a bridge between Ethernet and what I want to do on the other end is have the phone net connector. And you know you could then put together one of these for $10 and open source the programs and open source the hardware specs for it so that anyone can make one and make an, an Ethern, Ethernet to local talk bridge using a little microcontroller for 10 bucks, And anyone can do it. So that's what I've been working on. I've been learning how to use the Ethernet port on this Raspberry Pi Pico. But I did that over the summer, and then I had to put it on pause as school began. So maybe over the break, I'll get a, more of a chance to work with that. Um, you know, I'm, I'm just trying to do stuff to learn new things, learn how to bridge the old computing environments with the new computing environments, have fun doing it, and give something back to the community. Give something back to the other hobbyists that are also trying to do the same thing. There are other projects that people have done where you can plug basically a Raspberry Pi into a slot in the computer, and it can provide things like the Wi-Fi and the, the Internet and the HDMI outputs. But, you know, I, I kind of want to build, I want to learn about old-style networking, and I want to learn how to use these microcontrollers more than just blinking lights and turning motors on and off. Um, you know, so it's a learning project for me as well. And I think it's, I think it's kind of fun. But again, it, it is a learning process for me. I don't know how to do this. So I'm having to learn, having to do lots of experiments, right? Lots of little programs to do things like sniff packets and decode packets as they come in, and then try to figure out how to get the hardware to work. 
So it's really been slow. I'm sure if there's other people out there who have done this stuff in the past, they can just whip it out in like a couple of hours. I, I don't know how to do it, so I'm learning. So it's been kind of fun, but a slow process. Anyway, like I said, I, I got to get going. So it was been good um, hosting all of you and seeing all of your comments. And I hope I answered your comments if you if I saw them. I hope I answered them. And then um, hopefully over the winter break we'll do some more live streams and you know we'll just we'll just do whatever. It won't be related to any course we're doing. So we'll just <laughs> just do whatever you want to do. All right. So have a good weekend, everybody. I will uh, see some of you next week. And um, that'll be it for the semester. So you'll see some announcements, uh, notifications on YouTube when I have a live stream coming up. So keep an eye out for those. Take care, everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye.